<laughs> All right. Here's Ike. He's coming today to follow the Lord in Believer's Baptism. I got a call a couple weeks ago. He prayed with us uh, at the very end of the service. And uh, Ike, this, uh, we're going to talk about the ordinances today. We're going to talk about the Lord's Supper. This is the other ordinance, baptism. It doesn't make you saved. It just means you are saved. And Ike wanted to follow the Lord in Believer's Baptism today. Ike, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Grab your nose. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! <laughs> Good morning and welcome to uh, Stuart Heights Online Worship. We're so glad that you guys are with us today. And uh, wherever you are this morning, we ask that you take a picture and uh, post it on social media. Use the hashtag SHBC Home Worship. One of our favorite things to do after the service is to go back and look at pictures of you guys and uh, in, your, in your worship in your home and read the comments. We're loving the comments. I know some of you guys noticed last week that I got a fresh haircut, and it's true. In fact, I've had three fresh haircuts in the last uh, two weeks, and they keep getting better and notice. better and shorter and shorter. But right now, let's, um, let's pray together, and then we'll begin our worship service. God, we thank you so much for just the incredible opportunity that we have to worship you today. God, we want to sing your praises, and God, we want to lift your name high this morning. And God, we ask that you'd meet here with us across the city, across our nation this morning, and God, that you would um, move in our church in our lives this morning, God, that you'd have your will and your way. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Oh, my. 
hymns, we're about to sing the old hymn entitled At the Cross.
Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Just wanted to say how much I miss everybody, how much I miss seeing everybody on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. I've seen a lot of funny videos on social media about what our first service will be like once we're able to be back together. Uh, but I just wanted to say I can't wait to be back together. Uh, I can't wait for the body of Christ to be together again, uh, to see one another, to fellowship with one another, and just to be together. And so uh, I pray that that is sooner rather than later, um, but we don't know what that looks like just yet. And so just wanted to say how much I miss everybody. Um, and I want to pray for us this morning as we continue with our service. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Father, we thank you that you have shown your love for us. Father, we thank you that uh, we have your written word where we can, we can see your character. We can see how you have sustained your people through difficult times. Father, we thank you that we can read and see how you have made promises and kept promises. And so, Father, as we um, are quarantined, as we are social distancing still, Father, we just pray that you will help us to remember who you are. Remember that this hasn't caught you off guard. That we will remember your love for us. And Father, we just thank you that um, this morning we get to worship you. We thank you for the technology that we have to uh, be able to worship you from so many different places. We thank you for the talented people that can um, make all this happen with technology. So Father, we just thank you for that this morning. Father, we thank you that you care for us. Father, we thank you that you know our struggles, that you are with us in our struggles. So Father, this morning as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper here in a few moments, Father, we pray that this will be a time of remembrance. Father, that you will help us to remember what it is that you have done for us. Father, we pray that you will help us not to worry about what may happen tomorrow or even later today. Father, Lord, that you will just help us to remember during this time. You have done so much for us. We have so much to be thankful for. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your care. Father, we just thank you for all that you do. Father, we pray that you will lead us through this time. Pray that this time will be used to glorify you. Pray that we will grow, grow closer to you during this time. Father, we just thank you for your many blessings. Father, lead us and guide us. Father, lead, guide, and direct our uh, elected officials. Father, as we are, are getting some, some news that we are about to, um, some, of the, some of the measures are going to come away. Lord, we just pray that you will help uh, each of those officials to make wise decisions. Lord, that you will lead them that you will guide them, that you will direct them. And Father, we just pray that you will be glorified in all of this. We ask these things in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen. Hey, welcome, Stuart Heights family. Hey, uh, a couple things we want to do before we get into uh, the preaching today of the Word of God. Uh, what I want you to do is uh, uh, we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper at the end of the service. And so I don't know if you've already planned on that, but I want to give you about a minute or so to go ahead and make arrangements for that. But uh, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. So get, uh, if you got grape juice and uh, uh, manna, go ahead and get those. Uh, if you don't, maybe it's uh, orange juice and a cracker, or maybe it's uh, a Coca-Cola and a taco shell. Just get something that's liquid and something uh, that's a solid, and we're going to put that together at the very end. And, and I'll, I'll show you uh, what we're talking about as we get into the message today. We're talking about ordinances today. You saw the baptism. Was that awesome or what? Uh, today, we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper and what that's all about as well. And so what I want you to do is go ahead and get the resources for the Lord's Supper. And I want you to sign in. Let us know uh, where you're worshiping from, whether it's your front room, living room, dining room, uh, whether you're out at, uh, um, at the beach. I don't know if anybody's at the beach, but let us know where you're at and tell us how many people are worshiping with you uh, so we can get an account on that. So go ahead and do that. Also, get a picture uh, of everybody that's worshiping with you, especially when we do the Lord's Supper, and just put hashtag SHBC home worship. 
and uh, we'd love to see be able to see each other. And it's not going to be very long before we're going to be able to get back together, but look forward to seeing you. Let's have a little time right now to go ahead and get those things ready. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to go to school on the Word of God right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to talk about what is the Lord's Supper? What is the Lord's Supper? I think you'd be interested in to find out uh, where the elements came from. I told you to get uh, uh, a solid and a liquid um, because we're going to find out that they're really just symbols. That's all they are. They're symbols. Uh, when Jesus had the bread and the wine on Passover night, it was the most common food uh, and drink that they had. And so it was, it was bread and wine. But those symbols, the very first time they're used, I think you might find this interesting. It's in Genesis chapter 14. You don't have to turn there. Stay in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But listen to what it says. Abraham's going to battle. Lot has been kidnapped all right, and the, these five kings, uh, which uh, uh, Lot's kingdom, where, where Lot lived, the place where he lived, his king with four other kings went out to battle against these four other kings, and they lost. They, lo they lost the battle. And Abraham finds out that Lot has been captured or kidnapped with his family. And uh, so Abraham gathers his men together, his people that work with him, and he goes out and fights against these four kings, and Abraham defeats those four kings. He defeats them. God is with him. And he comes back. And as he comes back, it's interesting. Everybody wants to be his buddy. Uh, but there's a person who comes out and meets him. And his name is Melchizedek. This is what it says in uh, Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. It says, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Very first time in scripture that that's used. Let's talk about why it was used. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Wow. Well, it doesn't stop right there. That verse says this. And he gave him, Abraham did. He gave him a tithe of all. That's the very first reference of tithing as well. Giving back to God, honoring God, demonstrating your commitment to the things of God. Abraham went to a battle that he should have never won. If five kings couldn't defeat these four kings, who's Abraham to go up against four kings that were victorious? Well, I tell you what, he served the God, a most high God, and that was his Lord. And Melchizedek, who was not only a king, he was a priest, and he comes bringing bread and wine. Let me tell you something, they're symbols of victory and deliverance. Symbols of victory and deliverance. And so what we're going to do today, it's, we're going to talk about that. I find interesting, though, is that Abraham actually brings the tithe and gives it to Melchizedek. He's honoring God with that tithe. Now, this ain't a message about giving. This, this is a message about remembering. But I want to say this right off. It's, it, is, it is possible to give to God and not love him, but you can't say you love him and not give. And when I talk about giving, I'm not talking about just finances. I'm talking about your time. Is God worthy of your time? Let me ask you, is he worthy of it? Absolutely. How about, how about your, your talents, the gifts and abilities to make a difference in this world? God wants you to change the world. When was the last time you honored God with your talents, your abilities, and not only that, your treasure as well? And so we need to be faithful in those areas to demonstrate our commitment to Jesus Christ and our time, our talents, and our treasures. Abraham gave the tithe. The very first mention of tithe is the same time that uh, bread and wine are introduced into the conversation. Well, the symbols of victory and deliverance. And he tells us what we need to do is 1 Corinthians 11. He's going to tell us that we need to remember. We need to remember. In 1 Corinthians 11, listen to what he says in verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. 
This is what he says next. He says in verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. While these are symbols of victory, Jesus said he wants you to remember him through taking of this, the taking of the Lord's Supper. We are to remember him. This do in remembrance of me, to do it in remembrance of him. You know, he doesn't ask us to remember his birthday, but boy, we remember his birthday, Christmas. He does want us to remember when he went to the cross and paid the debt that we owed and paid that price upon the cross. And so when we take the Lord's Supper, we're going to take the bread and the wine. You're going to find out the bread represents his body that was broken for us. The wine represents his blood that was spilled for us. Those were common ingredients in any Jewish meal. And he says, those are the ones that we use. Well, in there we see we need to remember. Not only do we need to remember, we need to reflect. We need to reflect. Notice what he says in verse 28 of that chapter. He says, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We're supposed to look and examine our own lives. You know, we get caught up with the hustle and bustle and there are so many distractions in the world in which we live. So sometimes we get away from the things of God. And this is a time to examine our life, where we're at. And uh, he says that you're supposed to reflect, examine yourself. You know, Jesus uh, did this, instituted. It was during the Passover is when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And I find this interesting because some people won't take of the Lord's Supper because they feel they're not worthy to take of the Lord's Supper. Well, let me give you a heads up. You're not worthy. Neither am I. None of us are worthy to partake it. It was during the Lord's Supper that, uh, uh, during the Passover that Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. I want you to know that um, in the Passover, how that happened, it was, it was the last plague that was coming to Egypt. The people of Israel were gathered together. There had already been nine plagues to convince Pharaoh that the Lord is God, and he still hadn't let the people go. But on that 10th one, it changed everything. On that 10th one, uh, there was a, a, an item that the first child of every family would die that night unless there was blood that was placed over the door. The blood would be placed on the top. It would be placed on the side. I think it's a symbol of the cross if you think about it. Take a look at it. But during Passover night, he said when he saw the blood on the door. Now, I want you to think about this. It wasn't who was worthy in the house. Nobody was worthy. It was whether the blood was applied to the door or not. And he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass over you. None of us are worthy to do this. But if we have gone through the door that Jesus has offered, he said, I'm the door. Any man come, is coming, he has to go through the door. And I can tell you the blood has been applied to that. He said, when he sees the blood, he will pass over us. We need to reflect in our own life, though, where we're at. Examine ourselves in our faith. Well, we see the symbols of victory and deliverance, all right? But it's also a statement of our faith. The Lord's Supper is a statement of our faith. This is what he says in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And there it's a statement of our faith. The, the death of Jesus Christ and when we talk about the death of Jesus Christ, that's a part of the gospel. I want you to keep your finger there, but turn over a page to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and Paul's going to talk about what the gospel is all about. He says that uh, we do this. It's a demonstration of our faith. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which you stand, but which also you are saved. He says gospel is what saves us. What is the gospel? Look what he says. He says, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you've believed in vain. That's the difference maker right there. There's a lot of people who kind of attend church or play church, but they've never given their heart and life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you this, going to church never took anybody to heaven. Reading your Bible through in a year never took you to heaven. It's a personal faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us. You know, one of my concerns in the day and age in which we live today are our children, our youth. Our kids are getting ready to go to college. Some of you have kids that are getting ready to go to college. Let me ask you something. Are they prepared to go to college? Are they able to be able to answer the questions of the faith? You know, you, you take them to church and you think, well, I take them to church a couple times a month and I hope they hear the things of God. I hope they are able to grow. And it's a real challenge out there. I and mean, if you think about it, if you just come to church once a week, that's an hour. We have one hour. I want to tell you some of the best hours you can invest in your kids. How about three hours a week? How about for Sunday school an hour and church for an hour? And there's a program that we do on Sunday nights called Awanas that would be fantastic for your kids. I can tell you there's a spiritual warfare that's going on out there. Your kids are listening to their peers and, and you better be able to help them to give answers to those peers. Problem is a lot of parents want to be their kid's peer. You're, you can't do that. 
They need a parent. They got plenty of peers out there. You know, some of us, listen, um, being a parent sometimes is not very popular, all right? And sometimes your kids aren't going to like you when you're a parent. But you know what? You're doing exactly what God has called you to do, to be a parent, to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now you say, well, I take them to church and I'm hoping they'll hear the things. Listen, we're not their parent. We're, we're your partner. You're the parent. We're your partner. We want to help you help them grow in their Christian walk in faith. As they get ready to go to college, I, I think some of the things you need to do is be able to prepare them for some of the questions that they're going to face in college. Um, questions like, uh, where did God come from? Have you ever talked to your kids about that? Where did God come from? If God's all powerful, then how come there's evil in the world? And if God is all loving, how, how, how come God sends people to hell? Could you answer those questions? You know, it, Peter says to be able to give an answer to every man that asks of the hope that is within you. And a lot of times our kids can't answer those questions. I'm going to do a real quick commercial right here. I, this is a promotion. I think every family, if you have kids, this is a book you need to invest in. It's, um, it's uh, by a lady by the name of Natasha Crane. This is a fantastic book. It's a, a book on apologetics, how to defend your faith. And it's 30 conversations you need to have with your kid to help them grow in their faith and their walk with the Lord. Keeping your kids on your side. This is a great investment. You can get this book for 10 bucks on Amazon. Great, best 10 bucks you would ever invest in. Let me show you one other book. Here's another one she just brought out. It came out at Easter time. And it's 30 conversations you must have with your children about Jesus. You know, a, a lot of people think that uh, Jesus is a myth. Well, it's interesting. H historians that tell us... It, it, even secular historians, people are not even Christians, know that Jesus existed. But they'll hear a peer say it. And by the way, they're no longer talking to peers when they go away to college. They're talking to professors who may have an agenda that, uh, that you don't have the same agenda with when it comes to the things of God. Your kids need to be prepared. Their faith is going to be on trial. Uh, they're going to be facing the fire when they go to college. And so I want to challenge every parent to be able to bring their kids up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And here he talks about why kids do, the, unless they believed in vain, and their faith is going to be challenged as they go away to school. But he addresses what the faith is all about. Listen to what he says. Here's the gospel. Here's the full gospel. He says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Paul says, that's it. And Jesus says, don't ever forget, I, I went to the cross, I paid your sin debt. Christ died for our sins. So the part, first part of that statement of faith is the death of Christ, the death of Christ. Now in here, the gospel is, is four parts. It's two statements and two proofs, all right? The first statement is that Christ died for our sins. How do I know that Christ died for our sins? Look what he says in the very next statement. He says, for I deliver to you, first of all, that, that, that which also I, I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And it says this, and that he was buried. That's proof that he died. He was buried. You don't bury people that are living. You bury dead people. And Christ died for our sins and he was buried. And so um, we believe in that. We believe in the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop there. Listen to what he says next. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So it's the death of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Proof that he died, he was buried. What's the proof that he rose from the dead? I'm glad you asked that question. All right, let's look what it says in the very next statement. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the 12. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained in this present, but some have fallen asleep. And then he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Look at this. All these eyewitness accounts. Peter saw him. Uh, over 500, the disciples saw him. Over 500 eyewitnesses that Paul says. And many of them are alive today to give that statement. Think about it. Peter wasn't about to die for a cause. When Jesus was arrested and taken before the Sanhedrin and taken before the, uh, the courts of Rome, Peter scattered like the rest of the disciples, like sheep having no shepherd. They weren't about to die for a cause. And it's interesting, when Jesus rose from the dead, that changed everything. Why? Because Peter would die for the truth. Why he wouldn't die for a cause, he would die for the truth. And it's interesting, this passage right here, when Jesus rose from the dead, Peter saw him and he was willing to die for the truth. Not only that, it says that the disciples all saw him. Every one of those would die a martyr's death except for John. And it wasn't for lack of trying. They, I mean, they banned him on Patmos, boiled him in oil, but all of them died a martyr's death because of the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Over 500 eyewitnesses. How about James? James, his own brother, thought he was crazy. He said he was, a, he said he was, a, he was uh, out of his mind. 
James was a skeptic, but he came to faith in Jesus as well. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus Christ makes all the difference in the world. Um, so much so that Paul says in Romans 4, 25, that, that Jesus died for our offenses, but he was raised again for our justification. The resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees our justification, our salvation, that the sin debt has been paid. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 15, and he's going to talk about this all through here, that people argue about the resurrection. And, and Paul says, listen, without the resurrection, there is no gospel. There is no gospel. And so it's all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, our preaching is in vain, and we are be of most men miserable. So it all hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the gospel is the death the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. The proof of the resurrection are the eyewitness accounts. Well, he deals with the death of Christ, and he deals with the resurrection of Christ. And he says back in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, he says that uh, we are to do this, look at this, in verse 26, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Then he talks about the second coming. Paul talks about that as well in the very last chapter, 1 Corinthians 16. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22, he says this, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. And then he says, oh Lord, come. Talk about the coming of Christ. I like the way the old King James used to do it. It was like a mystery. It says, uh, um, he says, and those that don't believe in Jesus, uh, uh, that he resurrected, anathema maranatha. The word anathema means let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. And then maranatha means, and the Lord, please come. I can tell you this, that in light of this pandemic of what's going on, I have a message next Sunday. I don't want you to miss this. Uh, this didn't catch Jesus by surprise. Jesus warned us and told us this is what it's going to be like right before I come back. Next week, I don't want you to miss this message. I'm going to talk about the history of the future, history of the future. It's revealed in the Old Testament. It's talked about by Jesus. In Matthew 24, he tells us these are going to be some of the signs that are going to happen. And part of that are pestilence viruses that are out there. And he's going to talk about that. I want you to be here next week when we talk about this and hear this message because we're living in light of the second coming of Christ. And he says that when it comes to a statement of our faith, when we take the Lord's Supper, we're, we're recognizing the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, not only his death, but his resurrection. And not only his resurrection, but the coming of Christ as well. Well, we see what is the Lord's Supper, the symbols of it, the statements of faith. Who should take the Lord's Supper? Who should be able to take the Lord's Supper? In here, Paul is addressing the church. And I, I, I'm one of those people that believe that this is only be people that have a faith in Jesus Christ, who have a belief in Jesus Christ. Some of your kids are going to be with you today while you partake of the Lord's Supper. I, I want you to talk to them and tell them what this is all about. But unless they're a believer, this, this is only for people that have a faith and a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it's only those who are saved ought to be able to take the Lord's Supper. Remember, it's not whether we're worthy. It's whether we have a relationship with the living God. Not only those who are saved, but only those who are serious about their faith. Look what he says in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats... And drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. He's talking about we need to, it's not a matter of playing church or attending church. It's a matter of the relationship that we have with the Lord. And friends, that ought to be evident in your life. The pe only people that should take this are people who, who are saved and people who are serious about their faith and their relationship with Jesus Christ. Friend, let me ask you something today. Do you know Jesus is Lord and Savior? If you were to die today, and you stood before God and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? I can tell you again, joining the church won't get you into heaven. Being baptized won't get you into heaven. Taking the Lord's Supper doesn't get you into heaven. It's a personal relationship with the living God. If you've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, it's as easy as ABC. You say, it's that simple, Brother Gary? Absolutely, it's that easy. A, you have to admit you can't do it on your own. See, the Bible teaches us it's not of works, lest any man should boast. He says it in Ephesians 2.8. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourself, it's, it's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. He says the same thing in Romans 4.5. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You see, 
Pastor Gary, you're trying to tell me I don't have to do any righteous deeds? Paul even addressed that in Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. You have to admit you can't do this on your own. B, you have to believe that Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid the price for us. When he went to the cross and cried out, it is finished. Friends, that was a, that was a symbol of victory and deliverance. It is finished. It is finished. He paid the sin debt. You have to believe that Jesus paid the sin debt, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. And then C, claim him as your Lord and Savior. If you're willing to do that today, you can have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to say a prayer with me. If you've never prayed to receive Christ, I'm going to pray a prayer right now. And there's nothing magical or mystical about the words I'm going to say, but it's a commitment. If you're serious with God, I want you to know that God will mean business with you. With your head bowed, and maybe you'd say something like this, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he was buried, and I believe he rose again the third day. And right now, the best I know how, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my life to be my Lord and Savior today. I give you my life to do with it as you please. If you prayed that prayer in earnestness, I, I want you to know that God means business with you. And we want to welcome you to the family of God. We want to help you on this new journey that you're starting, especially with the next steps you need to take. One of the ways you can do is you can reach out to us. You can leave a message on Facebook. Uh, you can send us an email at churchoffice at stewardheights.org. Uh, or you can just leave a comment and we'll reach out to you to help you on this journey that you're beginning to take. I want to invite you to join us at the table uh, for the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do that and start in about one minute. See you there. Welcome to the table today. As a church, we uh, talk about us being three campuses, all right? One church and three campuses. And we have more than three campuses. I found out uh, for the last several weeks, we got about uh, six, seven, eight hundred campuses throughout Chattanooga. And so the church is meeting today in dis different campuses. And I want to welcome you to the table as we partake of the Lord's Supper today. If you have your solid and your liquid, we're going to partake of them. They're just symbols. It doesn't make you saved. It just means you are saved that you partake in the Lord's Supper. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says this, For I have received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. I want to give you a moment just to go ahead and pray. It may be just you yourself right there, uh, or you may have your family around you, but one of you lead in prayer, and what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll finish in prayer with this. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your love and your goodness. Lord, as we partake of the Lord's table today, representing these symbols, the bread, which was his body that was broken for us, Lord, we understand that. We understand that when Jesus went to the cross, Father, as he was there on the cross, it says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was pierced through. Not only that, it says he was bruised. And we know that word bruised means he was crushed. He was broken on the cross. And Father, let us never forget that. That Jesus took our place. He paid the sin debt. Lord, I want to thank you for your love and your goodness and what you provide for us. Father, may we never forget what Jesus has done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And when given thanks, he broke it and said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me.
And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. If one of yours, if you'd like to go ahead and pray, go ahead and do that. If you have uh, family together, if one of you could do that, and I'll finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to once again say thank you. Thank you for the sending your son to take our place on the cross partaking of the bread, his body, which was broken for us, crushed for us. Lord, as we partake of the cup, recognizing his blood that was spilled for us, but it was the blood of a new covenant, and we are eternally grateful for that, that, Father, we can have that relationship with you, not based upon our goodness, not based upon our works, but based upon what your son, Jesus Christ, has done for us. And Jesus, we are eternally grateful for that. We thank you and praise you for giving your life so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Thank you for joining. God bless you. Be the church. Thank you so much for being with us in worship this morning at Stuart Heights Online. We pray that you've been blessed and encouraged this morning as we've sung songs of worship to the Lord, heard from His Word, and also shared in communion together. We're so glad that you were able to be here. As we conclude our time this morning, I want to remind you of a few things. First of all, church family, thank you so much for how faithful you've been in giving. God has been very gracious and faithful to provide for us during this time of uh, dealing with coronavirus and not being able to gather in person to worship. But you've been very faithful in your giving, and we're so thankful. I want to encourage you to continue to do so. And just want to remind you as uh, the ways that you can give. First of all, you can give through texting. You can also give through online giving. You can find that information on our website at stuartheights.org. And then, as always, you can give your gifts uh, in person at our church office at 1505 Cloverdale at our Hickson campus. Several of you have asked with uh, tornado relief, how can you give towards that? Well, if you want to give over and above in your, your regular giving, your offerings, if you want to give towards tornado relief, if you just want to note on your gift uh, how much you would like to put towards that and just note tornado relief, we're partnering with our Southern Baptist, uh, Dis Southern Baptist Disaster Relief Friends uh, who are on the ground doing great work. We're also partnering with the Community Kitchen. And so if you want to give an offering uh, and towards the Community Kitchen, you can note that uh, on your offering as well. Also want to encourage you, church, to be faithful in praying, just as you've been faithful in giving. Also want to encourage you to be faithful as we continue to pray for one another. A couple of ways that you can do that. Again, you can go to our website at stuartheights.org and you can look for that prayer request tab there. And that's the place where you can share prayer requests for people to pray for you. Those are prayed for numerous times as you can see what other people have shared as well. And you can click on those uh, requests where you've prayed for those things and that person gets a notification that they've been prayed for. And we've heard so many people share with us that they are so encouraged uh, by those reminders that someone has taken their name before the Lord. And so I want to encourage you to be faithful as we pray together and for one another. Also, as you might have been seeing on the news, with uh, possibilities of things changing and, and some of those restrictions being lessened. And what does that mean for our public worship gatherings? I want to encourage you that for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be remaining in our online platform, but to pay particular attention to our social media platforms through Facebook and through Twitter, and to pay attention to emails you might get from the church, but also to visit our church website regularly for any updates as far as changes uh, that might occur because of changing in our context. But we are so thankful that you are here with us this morning. I want to pray together as we conclude our time of worship. Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to sing to you, to praise you, to worship you. 
Lord, to hear from your word. Thank you for the truth of it, God. Thank you for the gift of the good news of the gospel that we are reminded of as we share communion together. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to rescue us and to save us and to redeem us. And Lord, we're thankful. God, I pray that as we move through the rest of this day, everything that we do would worship and honor and praise and give glory to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, thanks again for being with us. We pray you have a great day.